let me just explain to you uh, the this is a new uh, session here at the Global uh, Skills Forum. Um, the policy pitch uh, has this uh, goal. The goal of bringing new ideas from people working that are experts in the field of education from different organizations and pitching these new ideas to relevant policy makers to ministers or people in government. There are several of these uh, uh, policy makers uh, at the conference, and uh, they are often traveling and visiting conferences, but sometimes they are not exposed to real new ideas. As Vika Spota uh, told, uh, told us this morning, what we want to do here is to try to make this uh, forum a um, mean to convey new ideas and to let new ideas emerge for education policies of the future. So we have here this morning uh, two speakers. Uh, we have um, Minya Chatterjee uh, that is uh, pitching an idea on how to bridge the skills gap between boys and girls uh, uh, facing and addressing the gender gap issue in education. And then we have Harry Patrinos from the World Bank that is uh, pitching an idea on addressing the skills gap through early reading, uh, teaching uh, from the very early stage rather than always trying to intervene at later stages when actually gets more difficult to uh, recover skills that have been lost early on in the education career. So here, how is it structured? And then we have uh, a panel of judges. We have uh, ministers. We have, uh, actually, we have uh, uh, Rosalia Arteaga, former president of the Republic of Ecuador. We have Professor Leonor Matgolis, Secretary of State, Department of Education from Philippines. And we have Matthew Premper, the Minister of Education in Ghana. So we are very honored to have these uh, um, uh, super uh, judges, a very uh, you know, well positioned to receive these ideas and hopefully also uh, in the position to implement uh, some of these ideas in their own countries. So here's how it is structured. So each speaker will come here on stage and has 15 minutes to pitch uh, their idea. Then uh, the judges will have 10 minutes to ask questions, and then they will have to vote whether the idea passes or fails. Is that everything clear? Okay, in the end, we will have a quick wrap up. So, thank you very much for being here and enjoy the sessions. And I call on stage Minya or Harry, who wants to start? Okay, Harry Patrinos. Thank you very much. Uh, honored to be here, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I want to make a very simple uh, pitch, and that's to do with uh, early reading. Many of you, all of you, uh, at one point uh, drove to, to work or to your office. You looked at a sign like this one, it told you where to go. Very easy. What if you couldn't read the language? Could be because the script is unrecognizable to you, another language. What if you couldn't read at all? How would you know where to go? These problems persist throughout the world. People are unable to make very simple decisions because of this lack, lack of reading. We know from, from the research, from the presentations this morning, about the benefits of education. The returns to education are very high. Every year of schooling increases someone's earnings by at least 10%. But those returns won't be realized by those people who aren't able to access quality education. In other words, those who cannot read will not be able to progress in their education careers, won't be able to realize those high returns. It's estimated that 25% of children in developing countries are unable to read. It's estimated that half of the children in middle-income countries are essentially functionally illiterate. And countries are spending a lot of money on interventions that may not work. But we know what to do 
to improve early reading. It's been proven effective and it's cheap. Governments, investors, and the development community need to focus on improving those early reading skills. My proposal, my pitch, is that no country should be expanding post-basic education until they reach universal reading achievement for the early grades, or at the very least, prioritize early reading. The returns to education are very high throughout the world. They're highest in Sub-Saharan Africa at 14%, and Middle East and uh, North Africa at the same level. Another year of schooling in Sub-Saharan Africa it raises earnings by at least 12%. The highest returns, however, at the higher education level. But given the way education systems are structured, to get into higher education, you need secondary. To get into secondary, you need primary. To complete primary, you need to be able to read. So those benefits won't be realized by the populations that are not reading. Society loses. Social returns to education are also very high. For every dollar invested in education in low-income countries, this yields $10 of benefits. Today's situation, where, whereby many children won't realize the benefits of uh, education because of the poor early reading environment, and our 25% figure, 25% who can't read, is actually based on subjective reporting. The real number could be much higher. And these numbers have not changed much over the last 10 years or so. Same time, education spending continues to increase. Governments, both donor and recipients, are investing large amounts of money into education. But donors spend more money on tertiary education than primary education, 35 versus 23%, according to the OECD. Countries spend, as a proportion of their national income, two to 5%, as a percentage of government expenditure, 12 to 17%. Large amounts of money on education. How do we get to this situation? Largely because of the success of getting children into school. The Education for All, the Millennium Development Goals set targets for access to education, and most countries have followed through. We have more children in schooling today than ever. This success, however, came at a cost in terms of quality of education not keeping pace, and therefore we have the reading challenge. In terms of years of schooling, we do very well. The average years of schooling for people in developing countries has increased by more than 360% since 1950, and by 136% since 1990. But many of those new entrants into the school systems are not reading. In some countries, as many as 90% of second grade students cannot read a single word. These early deficits manifest themselves. We have continuous uh, uh, gaps in reading achievement at higher levels as well. Fortunately, the Sustainable Development Goals put education at the forefront. They put quality of education at the forefront. They put literacy at the forefront. And reading, early reading skills, are a foundational skill that's required for future acquisition of skills and more advanced skills as well. So the goal is that countries focus on early grade reading because it is a foundational skill, because it can be taught effectively and cheaply. Reading is a foundational skill for writing, for mathematics, and future advanced skills that will become all the more important in the future can be taught very quickly at the early years. Our estimates are that within two to three years, we can double the number of early grade students that can read effectively by grades one, two, and three. Evaluations, rigorous evaluations, have shown that this is possible. So again, the recommendation, no country should expand post-basic education until they reach universal reading achievement for early grades. Governments, investors, and the development community should prioritize early reading skills. What to do next? Work with donors to develop country-specific and simplified literacy-focused plans, which include programs to train teachers on early reading acquisition and doubling the number of uh, students in second grade who are able to read. This is affordable. It's estimated that in 
Malawi, it costs just $10 per student to create readers within one academic year. It's estimated that this can occur very quickly within a year. A gap of a year of schooling can be made up very quickly. The program is very simple and has worked across geographies. We have successful programs in the Pacific Islands, in East Asia, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and the Middle East and North Africa. These programs give simple training materials to teachers, scripted lesson plans, structured pedagogy, directed instruction, however you want to call it. And these programs are proven very effective through several impact evaluations. The costs are very low for action. The cost of inaction will be trillions of dollars lost due to lost productivity and the inability of children to realize their potential. Thank you. Wow, that was very efficient in terms of timing. So we are recovering uh, fast the delay. So I'm asking the uh, judges who have a, a microphone if they have any question about this uh, very interesting presentation. Well, my name is Rosalia Arteaga, former Minister of Education of Ecuador, and I deal a lot with all these subjects that you mentioned. I'm happy to hear that World Bank is interested in uh, primarily education and uh, early reading. And I want to ask you, because uh, I am always concerned about the quality of reading, because uh, in Ecuador and in most countries of Latin America, uh, we put a lot of uh, efforts on reading. But uh, you know that there are levels of reading. Reading is not only to know how the letters are and the words, but to understand the reading. That's the big issue, because you cannot re read uh, instructions for manipulate something to do even a um, kitchen recipe or something like that. How we can improve this uh, quality reading? That's my question. So thank you very much uh, uh, for the question. I, I think, uh, again, the, the reading challenge continues throughout the, the student's career, even into high school. But the early reading gap is what uh, is fundamental. So children who are not reading a single word, and the numbers that I, that I was quoting earlier, 90% in some countries, are, these are students who can't read a single word in their own language uh, at grade two. So that makes it very difficult to to teach those children in later years. It makes the classroom very difficult to manage because you have uh, different learners, different levels of, uh, uh, of, of comprehension, very difficult for teachers to manage that classroom. So unless we address those early reading gaps by grades one and two, we'll have the problems uh, that you mentioned. We still need to focus on reading going forward, but uh, addressing the very fundamental challenge of even uh, letter recognition and word uh, uh, decoding is very important. The, the other skills build on these early reading skills, and I think this is part of the problem that we're having in many countries, is that those early gaps are difficult to address, and it makes teaching difficult in the later years. Uh, I, I cannot understand very well, because um, I was talking about quality reading. Uh, the problem is that, for example, I made some tests even with P, uh, students of PhD in Bolivia, Chile, and Ecuador, because I teach them at universities. And uh, when I say, read it, yeah, people can read it. And I say, okay, what do you understand of that? Yeah. And people doesn't understand. And when I say, w when the people say, okay, we understand, criticize what is the hidden um, meaning of that lecture, and people fail a lot. And that, that's the, the question, the big question is, understanding what you read, not only read, understand, and quality reading. Yeah. Thank you. You know, we're talking about, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but you know, I'm in Sub-Saharan Africa every four to six weeks, and it is about basic education. I totally understand when you get to PhD level, you want to critically analyze a passage. Yeah, of course, but get real with the problem, okay? We have to address the fundamental issue of primary education of getting people to read, okay, full stop. 
Okay, so it's very simple. People have to read. And, and, and is it 61 million people or something? Cannot, you know, don't go to uh, school in sub-Saharan Africa. It's way more than that. But they have to learn to read. Then you can start critically analyzing things. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's, that's fine. That's a Thank you. Um, my name is Matthew Prempe from Ghana. Um, you touched on two things that are very dear to me. Um, teacher education and helping the kids to read in the early age. And you talked about standard achievement. So we in Ghana are trying to get to that basics. We're going to that basics. How do we get support to implement this? Because we have said we want basic education to be just literacy, numeracy, and creativity. And, and, uh, what are the tools we can adopt to ensure we're we successful? Because what you are saying to me is just commonsensical. Uh, if you don't get the foundations right, you can never. But I want to say that when you say we shouldn't expend on post-basic education till we get these targets, the World Bank and donor institutions supporting education in sub-Saharan Africa don't really support these things very well. Um, we in Ghana are taking the bulls by the horns. We've redefined basic education to include secondary education. And we want to get the fundamentals right. Where do we get support and encouragement and, 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 and others to assure that we are successful in implementing this? Thank you, Minister. I agree 100%. And my, my pitch is that we, precisely that we do know uh, what to do. It is common sense, yet we're not doing it in many countries. Uh, I congratulate you for, for what you're doing. Let me talk about the Pacific, where we had a, a, a big reading problem. Uh, Western highlands of Papua New Guinea, a country with 700 languages and many other issues. In one um, uh, school district in the, in the, the province, only 4% of children could read a single word. The reading program that we put in place there started with an assessment. So for some teachers, it was the first time they knew that they had a reading challenge. We followed the assessment with a teacher training program, very focused, very uh, effective uh, tra training program, guided instruction that, that allowed the teacher to focus on early reading skills. It's not always, as you know, easy to, to teach reading in the early grades. So this focus material and then follow up with information and guidance to teachers led to a 25% uh, increase in readers in the first academic year. Our estimates were if these numbers were, could be scaled throughout the country, it would transform their education system. It's the first step in building the education system by recognizing what the issue is through these early reading assessments and then targeting those, those schools by giving the teachers the tools they need, the information, the training, and the simple materials to focus on reading instruction. Then we can build the skills that would allow for, for understanding and comprehension, as uh, uh, the minister said as well. So that this is part of a building uh, of the, of the uh, basic skills to writing, to mathematics, to advanced skills, and understanding and comprehension. Thank you. My second issue is that uh, there is a push in a multilingual country like Ghana, uh, many languages. There's a push uh, to go to something we call learning your early years in your native or mother tongue. Uh, it beats me because we in Ghana transfer people where you are taught as a teacher is not where you speak the language. Um, parents move, the teachers move health service staff move, and it has been interpreted that that mother language is the language, the local community language. And I'm, I'm not sure I buy the science behind this. Because, uh, anyway, I'm told that it doesn't work in cosmopolitan areas, and 51% of Ghanaians live in such areas anyway. So why would other donors be pushing such a policy and funding it rather than basic reading and writing? in a country like Ghana. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Leonor Magdalis Briones. I'm the Secretary of Education, which is the equivalent of the Minister. 
of education in the Philippines. Um, I don't know if I should be voting for this speech because it is already a major policy thrust of the Philippine government that early reading has to be um, recognized. And I myself, at the tender age of 76 years, uh, was taught by my own mother, who is a teacher, to read at the age of two. So by the time I went to regular school, I already knew how to read. And that's the case of, of many uh, youngsters whose parents already start uh, them on uh, teaching, uh, teaching them already how to, how to read and to write. Uh, also in the Philippines, um, our law requires a kindergarten studies before grade one. We, we call it the K-12 program. And so by the time a child enters grade one, more or less, the child already has a basic idea of, of, of reading and of writing. Um, my question, however, has got to do with the, um, the first, uh, the uh, former president mentioned about quality uh, reading. That would be of greater uh, interest to us. Now, uh, you were making recommendations as to what should be done to encourage early reading. I'm not saying that every child in the Philippines underwent the same process that I did, or those who underwent um, kindergarten. Um, you mentioned examples in, in developing countries. Would you have examples of piloting your ideas, your recommendations in middle level income countries like the Philippines with huge populations, with large enrollments and very serious financial and budgetary constraints? Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, we do have examples including from the, the Philippines. I believe the, the US government did some early grade reading assessments in, in, in the Philippines. And we continue to work uh, with, your, uh, with your government on some early reading uh, programs. Where, where the early reading can be useful beyond the uh, early grades is that it builds a culture of information, provision directly to teachers so they can use this to uh, structure their, their lesson plans and to build a stronger uh, classroom. The uh, example I would give about where this can be scaled to address the quality issues is Cambodia. Cambodia started with the early grade reading assessments, targeted pilot programs, and then they incorporated this into their assessment system so that now it's uh, built into their standard assessment systems. They do standardized tests at higher grades, and I think they're going to be the, one of the next countries to join the PISA program, PISA for Development. So this program has led to the measurement of education much more uh, strategically in the early grades, the primary school, end of primary school, and now moving to secondary schooling, which gives them the opportunity to gauge the, the, the system and then to address uh, the fundamental issues. The early re reading assessments have changed the culture of countries by bringing assessment and empowering the teachers to have what they need the tools, first the information, then how to address these early reading uh, uh, gaps. Because these, these persist in low-income, <coughs> middle-income countries, including even high-income countries. But having the information with the teachers and the methodology on how to address it is, is the fundamental key. And it can work in uh, uh, middle-income countries as well. Can I um, ask um, another related uh, question, which was brought out by my, my seatmate. I, as the last speaker, I would tend to follow up on the issues that they have already raised. Uh, one is, uh, you are recommending early reading. Are, are you recommending early reading in the mother tongue or in a foreign tongue? Uh, for example, in countries like the Philippines, education is bilingual. Uh, we start off with the mother tongue and then shift to to English as uh, an official, one of the official languages. Um, so which would you recommend? My recommendation is the national system. So if mm -hmm. in the national system you recognize uh, mother tongue uh, literacy or bilingual education, that's what we would uh, support with this. The countries that are having challenges in the language of instruction when it's different from the home language, 
even when they're tested in the home languages, they also fail. So the problem is, is widespread. It's the lack of reading skills, whether it's the national language or uh, the home language. So we, it, this, this works in um, mother tongue. It works in the, the national language if that's different from those languages. But uh, we would support whatever is the national policy. Thank you. Last question. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, is it very... Um, <laughs> Uh, you, you're talking about early reading, early reading at an early age. But we all know that in, in most countries, there are those who are left out, who fall through the cracks, who are not able to go to school, and who have to be taught how to read already when they're 40 or 30. Uh, what are the approaches that we are going to, to um, think about to bring in, in the Philippines, about 5 million people, young people and adults, are out of the formal school system? Because early reading, it seems, is directed towards those already in school. So uh, are there any thoughts, or is it out already of your topic? Well, of course, the, 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 the reading needs of, uh, of the population are important. This proposal, this pitch, was meant to reduce the number of those who are uh, older and unable to read. We still address that in the present, but as we go uh, forward addressing the early reading challenge, will also help prevent dropouts. One reason for dropouts, people don't learn, they don't progress, and eventually they're withdrawn from, from school. So we want to help reduce the number of adults without basic reading skills by addressing the early needs uh, very quickly when it's feasible and much uh, cheaper to address than later in life. Yeah, thank you, that's a very good point. So I would, uh, I'm sorry, I know that there might be lots of other questions, but we really need to move uh, forward. So thank you, thank Harry. You. Thank you to the judges. Now uh, you have to vote. So uh, the judges now will have to vote whether this idea passes or fails the test. If it passes, raise your hand. We have two, three. Three passes. Okay, it passes. That's a good. Okay, so now I uh, I call on stage Minya Chatterjee from Jindal Steel and Power on uh, measuring the gender gap in education. Thank you. Can you hear me? So um, a few years ago, I was working at a large global investment bank in London one of those that semi-exploded on subprime loans, but that's not what I'm going to be talking to you all today about. The number of women at this bank were awfully low. And the, while the bank tried to increase these numbers as their commitment to gender equality, um, you know, they tried their best, and uh, at every teeny progress that they made, they splashed it in their annual reports. Now, I was part of a uh, women's club at the bank as well, and so I had the chance to informally chat with many of my women colleagues very frequently. I found that uh, these women, uh, they felt that their roles at the bank were hardly a match to their aspirations. Some of them wanted to work in different departments. Others felt that they were deserving of a higher position or wages similar to the men. The men and the women, they, were, they had similar education qualifications. Uh, they had similar degrees from Ivy League universities and such. On the other hand, the men in an employee survey said that uh, they were uh, far more satisfied in their roles as well as in their wages than the women were. Now, the bank's focus in terms of in the context of gender equality was numbers. How to improve the number of women at the bank, which was anyways not much, but that was their focus. And they were ignoring all these very important, in my opinion, very, very important aspects of work as well. Some years later, um, in a rather dramatic career move, I quit investment banking and created my own not-for-profit organization. Um, and what I found was that these gender gaps uh, that were found uh, between men and uh, women um, in the, what they did at work and what they got at work could be traced back to how we measure and correct gender gaps in our education system. So in Qatar, for example, I found that uh, the enrollment, enrollment rate of uh, girls was at high school as well as at university was increasing rapidly as compared to the boys. 
That's great news, right? Um, in 2008 to 2012, the uh, enrollment ratio for boys at uh, senior secondary school was an 85.7%, and whereas for girls, it was far more, it was a 95%. Whereas the dropout rate for the boys in Qatar was, uh, was increasing rapidly, much faster than the girls. So the boys were dropping out of school, whereas the girls were staying on. So I tried to figure out what's going on. Um, and the girls that I spoke to, uh, they said that at high school or at university, depending on where they were, for them, that was an open, free space to connect with their peers before they got married off. The boys, on the other hand, they couldn't care less. For them, education was not a determinant for their living. For them, they could, they, you know, some of them gave me examples that they could lend their name to foreign investors and make a living. Now, a question for you to think about is that, is this situation reflective of an improvement in education for girls or not? Now, the answer would depend on your assessment criteria. So if you look at the number, the headcount number, then it's an emphatic yes. Yes, it is improving for girls. If you look at the overall situation, I think the answer is more complex. It's, rel it's, it's, uh, it's reflective of various socioeconomic realities related to gender in the society. I'll give you another example. In India, in the 1990s, the enrollment rate of girls uh, far lagged behind that of boys in school. Now the situation has changed. Girls and boys, everyone is li more likely to be enrolled at school. But the expenses on a boy's education is far more. A boy is much more likely to be attending private school, which in India is far better than the government schools. And again, the question arises that if we continue to measure education according to you know, enrollment rates or uh, number of years of schooling, is that enough? So what I propose here is that social arrangements such as education should aim to expand the capability of individuals to make appropriate choices in life. That capability could be tangible work skills. It could be decision-making abilities or whatever it is that is important to that person in that context. And if you agree with me on this, then I think the first step to do so is that to relook at the way we are assessing education in our countries and correct them accordingly. Now, our current assessments on gender, gender gaps in education, they are either measuring differentials in headcount, so which means uh, how many boys and how many girls, or they are looking at the resources, how many years of schooling. Third, they are looking at uh, the uh, outcome and mostly in terms of examination results. We are not assessing how, whether, whether learners are converting the resources into capabilities and whether those capabilities are being converted into um, an individual's capability to actually make, to build a life of their choice. Now, if we had not, in another context, if we had not um, imagined uh, measuring progress made on something as abstract as sustainability through the MDGs and SDGs, we would not have come this far where countries slowly but surely are taking action to make progress on that. Today, we talk about skills development, about empowerment of girls, but if you're not measuring that, unless we measure, measure that well, how, do we, how will we make progress on that? Now, having said that, I think an evaluation of what girls and boys can do with their education does not have to be terribly complicated. But it does require a shift in our way of thinking about gender gaps in education, and that is the challenging bit. Um, I would call this shift uh, make of making the journey between headcount to capability. So how do we make this journey from headcount to capability? First, let us agree that to add capability assessment to our typical assessment of how many, how much, how long, which frankly is, a more is the more transactional aspect of education. Second, how do we do it? I think we can assess girls and boys uh, on what they do with their education on four spheres, professional, social, civic, and personal. So professional would mean that understanding and obtaining the choices for work or not to work. 
Social would mean capability to include and exclude people in our lives. Civic would include um, understanding the governance context that we live in and abiding by our rights and duties. Personal would mean our capability to build and follow our own personal moral compass. Third step, we could conduct a national level independence survey to take stock of assessing girls and boys on their capability in these four spheres, professional, social, civic, and personal. The answers can be assessed according to various variables and weightages, depending on every sphere and the context as well. Fourth, hold the education institution where the boys and girls have studied responsible for the gender gaps that have come up. Monitor them and make them progress on closing those gaps. Fifth, build linkages between the capability assessments and policy. Policy not just in education, but in other spheres as well. Notice the context which can be changed so that to create a more enabling environment where girls and boys can lead a life of their own choice. So to sum up, we are not getting anywhere if we continue with our current assessment criteria of gender gaps in education and later at the workplace. We need to emphasize on skills, on what individuals can do with their education. In many countries, for such as in India, the same education does not guarantee the same set of capabilities to boys and girls. That is what we need to change. And for this, I would like to call upon a few pioneering countries, Ecuador, Ghana, Philippines, a few pioneering countries to start embark on this journey from headcount to capability, and I'm sure that the rest will follow. Thank you very much, Minya. And uh, now to our judges, do they have questions? Yes, yes Rosalia. Um, I agree with uh, what you say, because the uh, situation is similar in many countries, not only in India, but I think in South America. Gender issue is a big issue. And um, I think uh, the four steps or the four visions that you describe are, are really excellent. Um, but I, I also include, will include cultural issues uh, that are part of it. And um, education is a way to modify cultural issues uh, that are present in family mm -hmm. and also in schools. And in that sense, uh, teachers are very, very important. I uh, know that in Latin America, more, most of the teachers in basic school and secondary school are women. Uh, I imagine the same in India mm -hmm. yes. and in other countries. And um, uh, we have to work a lot with th those teachers to know how they can improve and uh, try to reduce the gap between men and boy results in education. I, I completely agree. It's two points on what you said, Minister. Uh, one is that uh, I kept mentioning context, because the context is so important. You cannot have one sweeping way of assessing this across the world. Um, so context, of course, cultural context is extremely important. The second bit is that, um, you know, in the five steps that I mentioned, I talked about uh, going to education institutions themselves, so teachers, principals, and make them responsible, and also policy makers as well. And there it's not just education, but cultural ministry. So, you know, different ministries which would ultimately change the context that, uh, you know, that, that, that the students are in. Thank you. Leonor Magdalis. It, 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 well, if it's very quick, because uh, it was. <coughs> I'm a doctor, basically. Uh, and I train the teachers for the change of behavior, and also the parents. Apart from their four factors, there is another very responsible factor in India which has been uh, very rightly picked up by our Prime Minister Narendra Modi. See, in just last survey in UP, it was a found that there is a sudden drop of girls in coming to school. So the Prime Minister instituted an inquiry. And you know what emerged? There was no facility for the girls, for the laboratory, for the aging girls. So now the Prime Minister has done. These four factors are OK, but there are physical factors for girl education to affect. That is my thought. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
you want to, otherwise I, we can move to the next question and then you answer Well, just both. a one-line response that I think the policy, my, my request was that to look beyond the numbers of girls and boys and what they are doing with that education. So, of course, I agree with you. There are many challenges with stop girls and boys and we need to look at those, that. But we need to add also that what are those girls if they were to come, what would they do with that education? Thank you. Professor Magdalene. Uh, you mentioned uh, several uh, criteria um, and going beyond the usual uh, head counting about boys and, and girls. Uh, are you recommending this uh, in a general way for, for all countries? I agree with the gentleman who just spoke that these gender gaps can also be explained, one, by the state of the economy of the country uh, for example, in the Philippines, we have noticed we, we, have, we have noticed that in the rural areas, the dropout rate for boys after the basic education, the elementary, they don't finish at all, is much larger than the girls. The reason is because at when they reach a particular age, they have to help out already mm. in the farms and help out and help uh, get a, a living. So there are very specific um, economic, as well as cultural factors. In certain communities, you would have girls dropping off because at an early age, they are already married um, off. Mm -hmm. So um, are you considering uh, the um, individual um, situations of the various countries which influence the so-called gender gap and the body counting which you are suggesting? Absolutely, Minister, completely. I think every country would have its own challenges and I am recommending this for every country. We need, to we need to include in our assessment, national assessments, the capability part as well. But what are they doing? What are the girls and boys doing with their education? And I think uh, in every country, in every locality, the, change, the, you know, the, the way of measuring that would be different, but you need to include that and I am recommending it for every country. You know, in many universities in the Philippines, the population of girls is much higher than mm. boys. And another factor which others say is because the girls mature much earlier than the boys and take their studies seriously yep. and make it through the university exams. At the lower level, uh, in the rural areas, they have to be um, uh, to help out in the farms and in the fishing exactly. and so on and so forth, That's which accounts example. for all these gender differences. And not only the the factors which you suggested. Great example. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great example. Any other question? Uh, why are girls only? As per the Lester's theory of uh, personal intelligence, established long ago by Howard Gardner, the great psychiatrist. Now, there should be regular practice of identifying the hidden talent as well as the interest of a student, whether he's a boy or girl. Once you identify, the automatically the question of segregation, whether it's for girls mm. or for boys, you know, it is off. So let us focus on identifying the real talent inherent in the personality of a, a student, irrespective of his boys or girls. This should be focused. Second, let me tell you m on my personal experience. What we are missing in education, unfortunately, throughout the world. I have been to America, I have trained people, I have taught people, I have taught their education secretary. There is absolute absence of the training which should be imparted for emotional competence of the teachers and the students. See, what happened yesterday, somebody in France? Somebody goes and starts firing. You have to, because these are the boys which are going outside the mainstream. They are the people who, who, whose brain, you know, uh, the entire cerebral cortex, this part of brain, is not functioning properly. And the reason is there is another part in the brain is the amygdala. There is no synchronization between amygdala and cerebral cortex. And we all doctors are also disturbed, you know. <coughs> we are trying to develop methods as to how you can synchronize the cerebral cortex and amygdala. That is also very relevant for education. I will request the house to take note of it. 
otherwise in the future times let me assure you we will find a lot of a lot of crimes a lot of bad things in educational institutions which Thank will you. distract these students let us be serious at this stage in 21st century this is my humble submission to this house Thank please you. accept Thank it you. Thank you. Okay, we have a final remark that Dr. Arteaga wanted to yeah, make very, very and then fast. we wrap yes. up. Thank you. Uh, I want to emphasize about uh, uh, what you say, looking beyond the numbers. Because um, like uh, I said during the, the first speech, um, it's very important to look beyond the numbers because we, we can have some numbers that say everything is okay. For example, 98% of uh, children in my country, they finish uh, um, school. And apparently they are literate. They know how to read and write. But when you go to see, it doesn't happen. And it's the same with women. Uh, you can see the numbers and say, okay, equal gender opportunities, mm. but not in reality. Exactly. Yes, that's, that's the perfect last comment that I could have got. Exactly, <laughs> look beyond the numbers. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's time for, yes, you may applaud if you want, but it's time for, <laughs> it's time for voting if this uh, idea uh, passes or fails. Does it pass? Yes, we have two uh, votes, so two out of uh, three. Oh, three? On a condition. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we have a conditionary vote. I vote for, for the policy pitch on the condition that the specific status of a country has to be mm -hmm. taken into consideration. Because there are reasons why there are more girls, yes. there are reasons why there are more boys in school. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, thank you. Thank I you. think what this, like, thank you, Minya, thank you, Harry, thank you, everybody, for listening. I think what we've uh, touched today is a very especially with this last presentation, um, it's interesting because it's about what is education about and what should we aim for? How do we build the global citizens that we are talking about in this whole uh, forum this year? So looking beyond the numbers, how do we build a quality education? Not forgetting the basics, because otherwise if we only focus on the very top, on what is next, we may end up forgetting the very early start. So keeping in mind the whole process from the very beginning, how to keep them engaged, but also remembering and always asking ourselves, what are we training these girls and boys for? How do we measure if we achieved that result, which is something that is beyond the numbers? So always keep asking ourselves about this, about also how to make both boys and girls achieving these results and how, how can we help them. So thank you, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the forum. I'm sure it will be very interesting for all the other sessions. Thank you.